Exactly. Come on, let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for this morning and all that has taken place in service. So excited and so grateful that we can come together virtually. Lord, as we see all that's happening, we can still come together and rally amongst ourselves with like-minded individuals and just say hallelujah, because it is the highest praise to you. So we ask that you would prepare our hearts and minds for what you have to say to us right now. We thank you for giving. We thank you for worship. We thank you for prayer. We thank you for fellowshipping with one another. But Lord, we need a rhema word right now in this day and this time. We need to be ready and willing servants who are informed and action-oriented for the kingdom. So help us to position ourselves to hear what thus saith the Lord. Lord, I ask that you would speak through my mouth and think with my mind. Lord, when it's all said and done, we want to not just be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word, that we would hear from you, well done, good and faithful servant. And then we can see what comes next. We thank you for it and praise you for it. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right. So as we talked about a little bit earlier, Renewal 2021, we're off to it. It's an adventure in thoughts and actions, emphasis on actions. And that renewal piece simply means the act of renewing. So the focus for us is on the part of the actions that you and I are called to take. And so we want to make sure that we just finished a series on prayer and what that looks like and how that should infiltrate our very existence daily, that that should be a regular habit of communing to, to, to pray without ceasing or to pray continually. And now we're moving into something else. And really, this is a part of a, a question, as it were, that has been with us since man has been um, thinking, right? That for eons, literally, there's an age-old question that is simply one word. And the question that represents uh, uh, this one word, it, 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 it's so much there that I think philosophers, um, great thinkers, all throughout the ages of mankind have wrestled with it. That one word really is why. And, and here's what that why is. We're asking ourselves, we're asking, because God placed inside of you and I an ability to think on a different level, that we're not relegated simply to just having a, 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 a our impulses guide us and, and direct us, but that we are thinking individuals with a sense of morality that can operate on a different plane than, say, the animal kingdom. There are other things that live that he's created, yes, but we are the only ones in his image in that we have a certain ability to think abstractly, to think mor with uh, morals and with, the, with a system of morals. And so there's a different level of existence for us. And with that, this question of why, what is our purpose and why are we here, has been asked over and over, over and over. And I want to spend some time talking about purpose as it relates to being. I want to say that again because this is kind of framing up uh, the, the, the discussion that we're going to have here for the next few weeks. Purpose as it relates to being. See, there is this thing where we are, because of sometimes I think how we are conditioned in, in, in this country or in the West in general, that we spend an inordinate amount of time uh, planning and thinking and preparing and going to school so that we can do something, right? We want to make sure that you know, you, what are you gonna what are you gonna do when you when you graduate high school? What are you gonna do after college? What are you gonna do? We are focused on making sure that we are prepared and we are ready to do whatever it is that we think we are supposed to do. And so sometimes we can mistakenly think that because we have not ar arrived at a certain destination with regard to the plans for our lives re related to what we are called to do, that we somehow aren't supposed to be doing other things. And so I want to see if we can spend some time kind of breaking this down a little bit because we, we want to make sure that we're focused on being specifically what God would have for us to be Regardless of where we are in life, meaning regardless of what we're doing, we have to be more concerned with the being. See, if we are uh, not 
careful, we will think that, well, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to be a doctor. And, and, and because I'm going to be a doctor, I'm preparing for that. And so on my way to preparing for that, that's all that consumes me largely. I'm not really thinking about a lot of other things. See, the power lies not just in being whatever you're called to be, a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker. The power lies in being what God has called you to be. So no matter where you and I find ourselves, we can actually, and here's the title of this series, Live life on purpose. Life on purpose. Life on purpose. This is the not so secret of living in victory. The not so secret of living in victory. I, I, I've seen books by the tons, articles by the hundreds, if not thousands, written on our purpose and why we are here. And as believers, as folks who call on Christ as king, we have to make sure that we shift our thinking from being fixated on what we're doing to more on what we're being. By allowing God's word and his spirit to literally infiltrate us continuously as we spend time in prayer, as we spend time in the Bible, as we spend time being led by the spirit, as we spend time quietly allowing him to deposit his presence into our lives, we rise beyond a perceived need to occupy a certain station in life. And we understand that by being, our being supersedes what we are doing. So I don't care if I'm a janitor, I'm being the kind of janitor that God wants me to be. I don't care if I'm a doctor, I'm being the kind of doctor that God calls me to be. See, our world needs for every single one of us as believers to embrace this and not put off living fully for Christ in our lives because when we do that, we are missing a part of the equation. We have to make sure that as we go, we don't relegate our relationship with Christ. Well, when I get older, well, when I become this or when I become that, then I'll give God my all. Instead, what we have to do is we have to be used as we go. We have to be fully surrendered as we go. That as we, whether we find ourselves in a high school or whether we find ourselves in graduate school, that we are being in graduate school and high school what God has called for us to be. Come on. This is not rocket science because what happens is what we will do is we will spend so much time looking at purpose from the standpoint of, well, Lord, what am I supposed to do that we forget? Scripture says it just right. All things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So while we're distracted by trying to figure out, should I be a doctor? Should I be a lawyer? Should I be a policeman? Should I be a fire person? Should I be in the military? All of these different career-oriented things, which we need to prepare for, which we need to give thought to, which we need to make. Uh, or Some of us, if we'll be honest, we're preparing for our retirement. Well, Lord, when I retire and I'm more free, then I'll be. Wherever you find yourself in life, we have to make sure that we are absolutely being used right where we are by focusing on what we are in him versus what we do in this life. I pray that you're hearing me. So we're going to spend some time today looking at, I was saying, Lord, where can we sum up? Where can we sum up your purpose? Not my purpose. You know, not, I, don't, I don't, it's not my purpose, <laughs> not my will, not my way. What is your overarching purpose that we can look at? What is, the, what is the macro view of purpose from you that should feed each and every one of us so that whether we're in elementary school or whether we're uh, established in a career, whether we're in retirement, wherever we are on the spectrum of life, we are actually being what you have called for us to be making a difference, right? So I want to take a look at Matthew 22. I want to take a look at Matthew 22, 34 through 40. And as I prepare to read this, I want you to understand something. I want you to get this uh, deep in your heart. Quite honestly, quite honestly, there is um, this, this particular scripture is, is ending where, you know, different Sadducees and Pharisees and religious leaders are challenging Jesus. They're attempting to hem him up. Right. And this is kind of the the culmination of this process. And so at this particular point, um, we have 
Jesus, he had just kind of chin-checked some Sadducees and, and answered their question. And, and as they were trying to hem him up and trip him up, it just wouldn't work. And so now we get to the place where a respected person who is believed to be like a lawyer, as what we would relate to them in today's times, and an expert in the law, no less, that he asks a question in an effort to trip Jesus up, and then Jesus gives his response. And it's in this response that I think you and I can find at least a significant amount of clues as to what God's macro purpose is for us that applies to us wherever we find ourselves. Wherever we find ourselves. Wherever we, f- that means if you're under the sound of my voice, hallelujah, this applies to you and me. There is no put it off or delay it. It is a right now equation. So let's read this together. It says, starting at verse 34, hearing that Jesus had just silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. So the the B team couldn't get it. So the A team comes together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law, right, and all the prophets, that is a significant portion of the Old Testament. All of the law, right, remember, (laughs) The first five of the book, first five books of the Bible, right? The Mosaic books, right? Uh, and then all of the prophets, the major and the minor. He is calling out a major portion of the Old Testament. All the law and the prophets hang on the on these two commandments. All right. So now we are talking about this notion of purpose. And although there are many voices that have added to it, I want to make sure that for us that are associated with Park Church, that we would understand that this is not just about what we are to do. This is largely what we are to be, because if we can get the be right, the do will largely take care of itself. Right. We prepare ourselves. We know what our gifts are, but then we aren't focused on that at the exclusion of being what God has called for us to be. And so in this particular scripture that we're reading here, there is something about this particular notion that uh, uh, sticks out to me. There are three fundamental things that I want to call out because, as Elder Rick told me this morning, we need to hurry up and get back home so we can watch 17 hours worth of pre-Super Bowl coverage, right? Because that's how it happens on these days. And I told him that's perfect. That is absolutely the case. But I don't know who your fan. I know my younger brother is a Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan for life, so I have to know that he's looking to watch this. So for no one else, Brother Keith, I'll make sure we get done so that you can get to watch that pre-Super Bowl show. Amen. Amen. All right. You guys see him on there. Send him a shout out. Make sure he's uh, rooting for the Bucks today. All right. So I want to lift up three things for us as we talk through this particular scripture, and I want to chase the concept of godly purpose has a right view of, number one, A godly purpose has a right view of motives, motives. So we're looking at what our purpose, checking ourselves for our purpose, knowing if our purpose is actually lined up with God's purpose. So let's look at Matthew 22, 34, 36, our scripture we just read a short time ago. The first part of that scripture says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees and slapped them down, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law. All right. So now, this was something that was not at all uncommon. As Pharisees and Sadducees would talk together, they would have opportunities to try to draw out things from the the, the wealth and the the, the dearth of Scripture that they would understand and be able to have a greater uh, realization of what God's Word meant and how to apply it. And here, this was not all that uncommon to use as a teaching tool. The trick here is if you were to break down that particular word of testing. See, testing can have two objectives. Testing can be like, okay, I want to just make sure you know something, and so I'm going to test your knowledge of it. But then there's this 
this testing that has this tempting feel to it where you're trying to trip someone up purposefully. You know, it's kind of like that special question that sometimes that bonus question that a teacher may ask. It's especially tricky. They know it's especially tricky and they want to just test your knowledge, but they also kind of want to get you a little bit frustrated because you really have to know your stuff and how everything uh, 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 shapes together in order to get that particular question right here. The motive is more along the lines of getting Jesus to trip himself up, that he would say something that they can use to justify uh, going after him and, and, and lessening his influence at that particular time. And so this is what is interesting. When I talk about motives, I need for you and I to understand that we have to be not be like the Pharisees. The Pharisees, although they had position, it was position without godly purpose. It was position that was seeking to, to, to get ahead with selfish gain. Let's go to Matthew 9 and 4. Got to resist the temptation to over talk this one. This is straightforward. It's going to teach itself largely. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? So here, this is from another part of scripture where a similar exchange was taking place. Here's the powerful part about Jesus. Here's the powerful part about our Savior, about our God, about the Holy Spirit. Our motives are not hidden from him. Can I say that one more time? Your and my motives are not hidden from God. That means even though you try to set yourself up in such a way like this particular Pharisee did, where he called him teacher, what he was doing was playing at being submitted to Christ for the listeners, but in all actuality, he was thinking that he was going to have a sufficient question that would trip Jesus up in his answer and allow for them to go after him. So he's fiending at submission, but he's not really walking in it. And like many of us, we are fiending at submission to Christ, but we're not really walking in it. See, sometimes we get into a place where it's more comfortable for us to do what we need to do for ourselves based on our feelings versus what God is asking us to do. This is interesting here because here we have a person who was walking in some level of authority, some level of leadership, and instead of him bowing down to the, risen, uh, to the, to the Christ who has not, hasn't been crucified and risen yet, but he's going to and acknowledging him as who he rightfully was, he is trying to trap him. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be found chasing after position, then getting into positions that I think I'm supposed to be in, and then I start to smell myself, I start to feel myself, and I start to look at my objectives and my desires as opposed to looking at that what God has for me to do, right? When God puts us in position, it is not just for us to get money. It is not just for us to have a, a, a notoriety. It's not just for us to be looked at as a, a part of high society, but it's instead to continue to do the kingdom work. So no matter where we find ourselves, we've got to make sure that we are not like that particular Pharisee. Here's what I mean. Position doesn't drive our posture. Our posture has to be that of continuous praise, continual prayer, continual reflection about who God is and how we are to serve him. Achievement without the proper acknowledgement is empty. There is no, once I become this, then I can do that. You and I have to be what we're called to be right now. Let's look at Proverbs 21 and two, there's some good scriptures today, so please have your pens ready. Please have your pens ready or take a screenshot at the end where you can see all the scriptures. Listen at what this scripture says related to this. A person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. Please understand that although you may look good on the outside, God is not a bit more concerned with what's happening on the outside at the expense of what your heart reveals. When our motives aren't right, that lets him know really where we are. We're really not worshiping him. We're really not surrendering to him. We're really not walking in submission to him. But instead, you and I find ourselves trying to have a secret agenda that would fill our needs, that would help us be all that we think we should be at the expense of being what God is calling for us to be. Godly purpose has a right view of, yes, motives, but number two, it has a right view of the master. Let's go back to Matthew 22, 37 and 38. Look at what it says. It says, Jesus replied. So Jesus now hears him. Remember, he knows what they're trying to do, and he lays it out. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first 
and greatest commandment. All right, let's break this through because we got a lot to get through in this one. This is meaty. All right, so first things first, heart, soul, mind. I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. Remember that phrase. I am a spirit. I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body, right? So let's go to Proverbs 17 and 22. I just want to kind of differentiate some of these things. Some of these terms we use interchangeably, not realizing that there's sometimes a nuanced difference between them. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. So I want you to understand that the heart that we're talking about is obviously not the physical heart that beats, but the scripture says life is in the blood. So the heart is the center point of physical life as it pumps and does what it needs to do for our physical well-being. Biologically, we are able to live because that heart is pumping blood through. Well, in the same fashion, when you see scripture in the uh, Old Testament and New Testament, it is looking at the heart as the seat of everything, as the seat of, of will, as the seat of, of, of processing and, and being our spirit man, right? Remember the scripture says, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The whole rationale for God creating Eve, at least in part, was the fact that while he was fellowship with fellowshipping with Adam, Adam was a physical creation and our God is a spirit being. And so he could not fellowship with him in the same way that Eve would be able to fellowship with him. And so there's this element of acknowledging that, yes, we have this physical outer shell. It's why we don't get so pressed when loved ones go on to be with the Lord, because we know while they are absent from the body, they are present before Almighty God. Hallelujah. Somebody needed to be reminded of that right now. So we understand that there is a heart spirit uh, 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 issue that is happening here when he's talking about love him with all of your heart. It is, it, it, is, it is the seat of our very intellect, our, our emotions. Everything is right there. Now let's go to Luke 1, uh, 46 and 47. And I want to talk about this, this soul. It said, all your heart. And then the second thing was the soul. Look at what it says. It says, and Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. You see this slight nuance here? Here's the nuance. The spirit receives, the soul gives out and glorifies. The spirit is the receptor. We connect. We worship him in spirit. And come on, hear me. We worship him in spirit and in truth. So we get that connection there. But then from my very soul, I cry out to him. I glorify him. I magnify him. I elevate him. It's from my very innermost being. Everything about me, right? I I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. Let's go to the next one. Second Corinthians 10, five. Let's get that up. So it said with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, look at what this says. Second Corinthians 10 and five. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So we talked about the heart or the spirit. We talked about the soul as to be contrasted by the spirit as well. It's a little bit of a difference. Now we're getting into the mind when we're talking about how to do this purpose notion that our thing has to be totally focused on him. Here's what what I want you to get out of this. There are so many competing thoughts so many competing knowledge uh, uh, um, bases out there, so many different religions, so many different things that can occupy our mind and draw us away from the essential fact that Christ is king. We have to understand that our whole job is to line ourselves up, to set ourselves up against anything that seeks to down the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought in our mind and make it obedient to Christ. So we have a mind that rationalizes. Remember, we talked about it. It's different than a dog or it's different than an animal or it's different. Yes, they have some cognitive capabilities. And we're all, I don't know about you, but I'm always tickled when I see um, animals that take on human characteristics. But make no mistake, there is a dividing line between the animal kingdom and humankind that we have an ability to think on a different level. And that thought process is one that has to be intentional and purposeful where we take it captive. Listen 
cursing at the language. We literally put handcuffs on allowing our mind to wander all over the place and instead bring it up and make sure that it is nourished with the full knowledge of God. Here's the bottom line overall. (laughs) We're called to love God with everything. (laughs) We're called to love him with everything. See, that applies to the to the to the baby that has the, the, the mindset and can understand and comprehend. And that, 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 that applies also to the person that's on their deathbed, having lived over 100 years, and now they're looking forward to moving on. Wherever we are, we have the ability to take captive our thoughts and praise God with them. So it's through our heart and our, our spirit, it's through our soul, and it's through our mind. Godly purpose has a right view of yes, motives, making sure our motives are right at all times, making sure we have our minds firmly set on the master himself, and then, number three, on mankind. Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine 39, and 40 says it this way. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Listen. You and I can't love God without loving his chief creation. Let me say that again. You and I cannot love God without loving his chief culmination of creation. We are made in his image and in his likeness. This is what he said. He he dances over us. He he is counting the very hairs on our head. He has dispatched angels to keep count of the tears that fall from our eyes. He is very much into you and I. He is like a mother hen brooding over their chicks. He is caring. He is loving because we are a byproduct of his creation. We are with his hands, with his heart, with his mind. He brought us into being. In fact, scripture says that before I was, before you were in our mother's womb. He had a thought for you and I. And so because we are here, it shows that he is loving. He is caring. There is purpose. There is destiny. There's a plan for you and I. I don't care who told you you were nothing. You need to rethink the whole evaluation. You need to make sure your equation is right. That God plus me equals destiny. That God plus me equals purpose. That God plus me equals that I am, I am the everything to him. <laughs> That he sent his son to die on a cross for you and I should be proof enough that he cared not just for mankind in general, but come on and put your finger, point your finger at me. Come on, get your, put your finger up. Come on, this is, come on, put your finger, put it at your chest. Come on, put it at your chest. There you go. Come on, come on. I can see you. I can see you cheating. Come on, there you go. Put it on your chest. He sent his son to die on the cross. I have one son. I have two daughters. I have one son. Let me tell you something. Love all three of them. And if your salvation is dependent upon one of them losing their lives, somebody going to hell. (laughs) Can I just be honest with you? (laughs) Can I just be blunt? Can I just say it that way? There's there's a hell fire brimstone waiting for some folks. That kind of love I'm trying to get to. That kind of love I'm trying to realize. He sent his only son, and yet you and I allow people to talk to us like we're sideways. People are going to do that, but then we internalize it, and then we start to believe it. We believe we're ugly. We believe we're fat. We believe we're not worthy of true godly love. We believe that we're not worthy of of, of accomplishing great things in him. We believe we're not worthy to be used mightily for the kingdom. We believe the narrative that the world and the enemy of our soul and even ourselves sometimes sell to ourselves instead of understanding that God made us and because he made us, we are special. Go to 1 John 4 and 20. Got to love yourself, got to love others. Look at what it says. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. You're disqualified. You're DQ'd. You're out of there. Yellow flag, ejected from the game. You've got to go to the locker room and wash up because you're disqualified. You can't say you love God and don't love people, right? And people include you and me. Let's go to uh, Leviticus 19, and I, I'm going to run through a bit right here as we prepare to close. I want us to get ready because I'm, I'm doing good on time. Hallelujah. Uh, I want to run through um, 
this particular scripture first, and then I want to land on our closing thoughts. Um, When you reap the harvest of your hand, do not reap the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. Listen at this. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not deceive one another. Do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not hold back the wages of a hired worker overnight. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God. I am the Lord. Do not pervert justice. Hallelujah. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart, or just be a fellow human for us. Rebuke your neighbor, frankly, so you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You see what God did, what Jesus did, When he just took that little piece, said, love your neighbor as yourself, he was referring to all of that. I need you and I to understand. My wife and I went to a concert. Young man wrote a song. It was beautiful. He said, love is a verb. We have to understand that love is a verb. It is an action. And so when we're talking about purpose over the next few weeks as we prepare to close, I want you and I to focus in not so much on thinking that the equation is one that is firmly fixed on what we do as a profession or as a career or as, you know, activities. That's not what's first. That's important. But what's first is that we have a right view of purpose that is informed by God that makes sure our motives are accurate, that they are where they need to be, that we have a great and an appropriate view of the master himself and that we look at mankind rightly. I don't care. I said mankind. I didn't say black folks. I didn't say white folks. I didn't say Latino folks. I didn't say Asian folks. I didn't say any. I said mankind because that's how he's teaching us. That love has to be an action. It has to be a verb where we are doing things. And what this will do for you and I, it, it, I think it has the ability to revolutionize on some level because some of us are waiting for something. What are you waiting for to reach out to your neighbor? What, are you wait, what am I waiting for before I put a little card in someone's hand that says, do you know Jesus? Do you want to meet him? Come on and follow me. I know a place where you can learn more about him. I know a place where we can take you and, and we, can, we can make sure that you're cared for. I, there's a place right here, right here, where we can get together. Even though we're not getting together physically, we can get together through the advent of technology and, and, and share. And we can make sure that you know that you matter and that you are loved. And that we can pull our efforts and pull our resources and be a blessing to those among us who are less fortunate, that we can demonstrate love being a verb, that we can walk in action steps that make sure that God's people, no matter what they look like, no matter where they fall on the spectrum of life, that they are cared for and loved and given the dignity and the the, the integrity that God put in them at creation. This is different than just what I am to do. You and I have to make sure that we are more interested and who we be, if you'll allow me to say it that way. The being supersedes the doing. And this will allow us to make an impact 10, 100 times what we currently do when we sometimes can find ourselves distracted by going after worldly purpose. Worldly purpose. So I want you to make sure you, you grab a screenshot of that uh, uh, summary. There's a ton of scripture that we gave today, and I want you to just marinate on it. Club 52, 
I'm sending out the scripture a little bit later today. I have an idea of what it is. I've gotten a word from some of y'all. You're sending it too late. We got to make sure we get that in a timely fashion. So I'll get that to you later on today. Right? But we've got to make sure that we understand that life on purpose is not just us picking a great uh, profession or reaching a certain level of achievement or getting to where we don't have as much to do. Once the children leave the house, then, Lord, I can give you more of my uh 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 uh. We've got to embrace godly purpose that is so fundamental, it, it literally invades us wherever we are. And whatever we are doing, we are doing it to the glory of Almighty God. I pray you hear my heart. I pray you understand where our conversation is going. And I encourage you to join in with us over the next few weeks as we talk more about purpose. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you in the name of Jesus for challenging us to be more concerned with the being of being your children versus the doing of being your children. You let us know from your own mouth to love you with all our heart, our soul, and our mind, to love our neighbors as ourselves, that everything hangs on those two things. It is the cross brought to life. And so we ask that you would help us to take this challenge and to bury it in our very hearts, that, Lord, we don't have to wait for someone to reach out to us before we reach out to them. We don't have to wait for someone to check in on us before we check in. And we don't have to wait for someone to care for us before we care for them. But that, Lord, because your word compels us to care for those who are hungry, for those who are in the prisons, for those who are sick, that we would just be driven to do that. And that, from your perspective, is life on purpose. For those of you that don't know you in the pardon of their sin, Lord, we ask that you would help them to understand that you came, you died, you were buried, you arose, you appeared, you ascended, and you're coming back. And that, simply put, is the gospel. Lord, and then from there, you went on to help us to know that if we um, confess with our mouths and believe with our hearts that you raised Christ from the dead and that he is Lord, that we shall be saved, that anyone who is making that decision would just link up with us in a breakout room right after service so that we can affirm that with them. And we thank you for it. We praise you for it in your son Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Listen, so excited about the start of life on purpose. I want you to join in with me to make a commitment to exploring this over the next few weeks that by the time we're done, we know no matter where we fall in life, no matter where we are, it's not our position, it's our posture of serving God without reservation that matters most. Never forget, God loves you. College Park Church loves you, and I love you. And there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. God bless, and we'll see you the next time.